Salutări tuturor, bine ați venit la Celebrity Talks, seria de podcasturi dedicate personalităților care vizitează Universitatea de Vest din Timișoara. Îl avem alături de noi pe Werner Solers, un profesor foarte cunoscut în Statele Unite, a predat la mari universități, cum ar fi Harvard University, Columbia University, Washington University și lista poate continua. Domnia sa este în Timișoara și la Universitatea de Vest pentru a primi onorabilul titlu de doctor honoris causa. Sir, thank you for accepting our invitation and of course welcome. Well, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me and for giving me this honor. I'm very happy to be here. First question, it might sound a bit silly, but I think it makes a lot of sense in, in, in Eastern Europe. It might sound a bit silly in, in maybe in the United States. So your, um, your, your field of study or one of them is Afro-American studies, right? Um, and I would like to know why is this important for, uh, for people in general? I mean, it makes sense in the United States, but I mean, it's a bit, I think it's a bit different in, uh, in Europe. Well, I think if you're interested in the relationship of minorities in, in any modern society or even in older societies, I think the, the study of African Americans is a wonderful field because, first of all, it has real historical depth and it has quite a few participants in a very complicated situation, uh, transatlantic transport, enslavement, partial freedom afterwards, in which many witnesses offered testimonies. So going back to the 18th century, there's a long tradition of writing about these experiences that give you a, a perspective that I think is quite unique for a minority situation in, uh, in modern societies. Uh, also, the, the difference that is being built up around color in that case resembles so many other differences, you know, built around religion or a geographic origin, whatever people uh, come up with. So I think it's, I look at it as a kind of model to understand minority-majority relations in general in many, in many societies. Can one speak about canons in the field of, for instance, Afro-American literature? Mm -hmm. Can one speak about canons? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I think there are um, you know, many different selections of, uh, of texts. There certainly, first of all, is a musical canon, you know, that goes back very deep from religious songs to the music that now you, know, you hear everywhere in the world. Uh, you know, hip hop is uh, something that comes out of the African-American uh, tradition, and that's a kind of musical uh, canon from sacred to secular uh, music. In literature, there are many different uh, lines that you can follow up. Uh, one uh, line that has interested many readers now is, for example, the issue of black women uh, writing. So is there something like what scholars call intersectionality? Is there something special about your situation that gender intensifies or that gender also attenuates in a minority uh, situation? I think that's also uh, exciting. Um, and I think then there's the cultural diffusion uh, canon. You just look at those aspects of African-American culture that have radiated outside the United States. And that also has a long tradition. The first one who looked at this was a French egalitarian who wanted the Jews to be emancipated in France and who studied the Africans around the world who had done interesting things from his uh, point of view. Abbe Grégoire is his, uh, is his name. So it was outside the United States that someone said, ah, there's, a, there's a field, there's a canon. And his book for a long time really established a kind of listing of very important people of African descent who have made contributions and also unique um, uh, statements that, uh, that still resonate today. Is it still a fight or should we see it as a fight? You know, the so-called battle between canons, European canons, other kind of canons. Of course, um, I'm asking the que this question, um, having in mind the um, s at some point so annoying debate about uh, political correctness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I always believed great books are very important. The the canon, if we think of one great canon of what used to be called the West, you know, in that sense, uh, that canon changes all the time a little bit, but there is a sort of a structure that remains, and I think most 
scholars and literature will uh, accept some of the force of that. But that doesn't mean that you don't follow other lines of inquiry as, uh, as well. I never understood that this should be an oppositional thing. You know, you either read, uh, at the moment you can't even read Dostoevsky, but you know, you read uh, something that you think belongs to the great book category or something that belongs to another canon and that's, that, that should be completely uh, incompatible. You can't do two things at the same time. Like you, you, you can't, if, if you like jazz, you can't like Mozart, you know, it, idiotic things to, uh, to me. Uh, I think we are more pliable as human beings and open. Also, whenever you go somewhere new and you hear music you've never heard, you're first of all intrigued and also attracted because it's, uh, it's a, a new experience. And I think in that sense, uh, you can't always only read the same things. Uh, and you have to remain open to, to new impulses. Uh, you know, there are people in Romania who would maybe say something like this. Oh, come on, Afro-American literature. I mean, we should start, we should start by reading Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. um, um, the great um, American novelists. Um, I don't know, French literature. These are like the, this is the real literature. This is, uh, otherwise it's just, you know, um, um, a debate about political correctness and nothing more. No, as I said, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, situation. I think it's uh, perfectly compatible. I mean, you know, D um, Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground, for example, resonates. Uh, Ralph Ellison uh, wrote a novel in the African American tradition uh, called Invisible Man, which takes off from Dostoevsky's Notes uh, from the Underground. And uh, Richard Wright, who uh, also is a precursor of, of Ellison, uh, was a Dostoevsky fan. So if you read the three of them together, you see there's actually something they have in common, which is a deep concern for human suffering, for absurd situations of, uh, of that, that Dostoevsky, you know, put in a way on a, on a point that then inspired other writers to do with. Now there may be a Russian writer who reads Dostoevsky. There were many Russian writers who read Richard Wright in the old communist days because he was a member of the Communist Party when he started writing. Uh, and who then would try to spin something off in that direction. So I think culture is always a, a, a give and take and an exchange. I, I don't see it as an either or. I, I, I what would you say to someone who would uh, say the following thing? Okay, there is no way uh, someone, um, um, an Afro-American novelist, uh, could be as good as Dostoevsky. There's no way this could be possible. Well, I would say try Ralph Allison. That uh, seems to be a very good chance right there. Or Toni Morrison, I think. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, one of my favorite writers is Charles Johnson, who is a philosophical uh, novelist that really blows your mind when you uh, read. He has a wonderful novel called Oxherding Tale that I would put up right into the great books uh, uh, category. Um, you know, when Goethe thought of world literature, he had exactly something like that in mind, that there is a long tradition of great books, and then there's constantly something changing. And for Goethe, when he read Persian poetry, he thought, you know, this is something I, I had never seen. And he wrote in that manner for quite a while. And he said, there is something like world literature, and there is an exchange, and there is a give and take, and that's, that's what we have to be alert to. It gets boring to be in a, you know, saying we only do you know, these 12 books, and they will be the books forever, for all generations <laughs> in perpetuity, is almost a horror scenario. Uh, so it's a matter of, um, I don't know, spicing things up. Uh, we, I don't know, new generations maybe get bored with the old canons. Well, let, let me, uh, Karl Mannheim, uh, a sociologist of, now, of, of, um, uh, of, of, of knowledge, uh, wrote a wonderful essay on generations. And he started out saying, can you imagine a society in which nobody ever left the position in which they were? People would live endlessly. And you know, if you are now, uh, whatever, a professor at the university or a dean at the university or a mason, you will remain this. And no, there will be no fresh blood ever entering. Uh, you know, you immediately get the feeling of horror. So it's not a matter of spicing up. 
but we change all the time. Our bodies change every seven years. Uh, and in that way, cultural, uh, culture is always in, in flux. And a culturally oriented literary critic has to be a little bit, uh, have his ear on the ground to, on the things that change, not only on the things that have remained. And they're great things that I love for a long, long time and that I like to read again too but not at the expense of not reading other things. That's where I just draw the line. I hope you don't mind that I'm going to be again the devil's advocate. No, go, go ahead. Uh, I'm sure there are people in Romania who would say, well, yeah, of course uh, p uh, things change. Uh, of course, there is this Heraclitian perspective, but we should wonder why are uh, things changing? Maybe it's because of there are, you know, these new ideologies that make things change and maybe this change is not so organic or so natural and it's uh, in a way dictated, imposed by different, you know, um, um, structures, uh, rhetorics, ideologies and so on and so forth. Well, I mean, I, I would agree. I mean, I think it's stupid if you have only political reasons for including something or excluding something else, uh, then you haven't really read the books, it seems uh, to me. If you say, I cannot read this book because it was written by someone who is something X that I don't like, then you're actually not saying anything about the book, but just about your, your own prejudice. Uh, so that I agree with, I think. I would, uh, I would not think uh, having a, a political motivation only for including something is is not going to last because you know the, the in five years people will also see what they were uh, what they were kept from because somebody just said my course will only you know have books that are people who are absolutely politically correct and all the pronouns will be perfect and i don't know whether in romania you have the question too about gender correct uh, pronouns and so forth you know so, uh, you know, that, that I think uh, doesn't, ex doesn't excite me. I, 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 w I would never try to set up a reading list that's based only on these external categories. By the way, sir, now I'm going to ask the question, yeah. that question, <laughs> the most difficult one. Uh, because we were, you know, you are, we are kind of running in circles around mm. it. Uh, so there are many people in Romania who, in a way, fear who are very skeptical regarding political correctness. Mm. Are, mm. They, are they right to be so? Are they wrong? Well, in, in, uh, how, does it, how does it affect them directly in, in Romania right now? Is it something they read about in the, in the papers? Is it something in their daily lives? Is there, um, I mean, for students, where, where, where do you now have to fight against political correctness, I think I would be interested in. Yeah, that's actually a very yeah. good question because I think this is also something, uh, and this is me talking, of course, mm -hmm. uh, I think this is because they see what happens uh, over the border, not mm -hmm. our, you know, uh, border right. with Hungary, for instance, but mm -hmm. like a symbolic border. So they right. see what happens in the West. So there are many people in Romania who see what happens uh, in other countries and the, the United States of America is definitely one of their um, area of interest. And I think they are scared uh, because, you know, there are many people who maybe went there or who read in different contexts that um, uh, they see it as a way of, you know, imposing um, um, a way of life that reminds them of uh, of the communist period. They mm -hmm. see uh, they see that people cannot actually express their thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, they think that uh, you know their freedom uh, might be uh, in the future controlled by um, again groups of interests, mm -hmm. ideologies, and so on and so forth. So I'm not sure if this is something that actually uh, is unfolding right now in Romania. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's something, this, uh, this is more like something that uh, they anticipate that it will definitely happen in the, in the future. Mm. Well, I mean, I can imagine within the European Union, there is a question of, uh, you know, you want to create any kind of a group and it should have representatives of many different uh, countries. So there is an idea of representative quality. Not each one who is in that group will have the same qualifications. And so somebody in the group may feel, oh, this one is in there only because there needed to be somebody, whatever, from Denmark or from Portugal who is uh, part of that. And I think that's the same kind of conversation 
that you see in American multicultural society that you know if you want to create an integrated society you want to make sure that all groups are represented but that creates ressentiment you know a little bit of saying oh you know I, I would have been better this would have been better without Hungarians <laughs> I'm just picking up your example you know, this would have been better without those people uh, in it. And I think that ressentiment is something one can address head on because the, the danger of following it is uh, working against a really integrated society. I mean, in America, actually, the news is good news that most Americans are happy in situations of diversity. Mm -hmm. Employers in America now like to hire people of different races more than they like to hire people from a different political party. You know, if you're a Democrat, you're running a company, you don't want any Republicans in your company, but you like the idea of having, you know, Puerto Ricans and uh, having uh, African Americans and new migrants from the Near East and so forth. That, you know, gives you a feeling, Clinton used to say, you look like America, you know, mm -hmm. so a feeling of living uh, a, a form of, uh, of integration. But there is that nucleus of a problem that if you have so much of a ressentiment, there are many people in places where they shouldn't be because they are only there because of a, of a quota, then that actually becomes a, a political dynamite. That's a dangerous thing. But I don't think America is there. I think the, the quibbles are usually about small issues in universities. It's not, not, a, not a broad uh, social issue that I see. Yeah. Because at the same time, there are, I think, uh, many people in the United States who would s perceive it, for instance, as a form of censorship. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is something quite common in Romania. They, they perceive it as a form of mm -hmm. censorship. Mm -hmm. Are they right to perceive it like that, or is it, is it... Well, I mean, censorship immediately, you write something and somebody says, no, that you can't mm. write. And that outright situation happens sometimes, I think, as, al as old as journal. I mean, poor Dostoevsky had to go into exile for you know, not following what the censors uh, uh, dictated him to do. Siberia isn't very nice as a, uh, as a response. Uh, but it isn't always uh, you know, something more. I think what's worrisome, what I see in the press reportage, is an idea of self-censorship, that you don't want to say certain things because you think you might offend someone or you might offend uh, uh, you know, some kind of common sense that you are running against by what you're saying. And I've always told my students and believe in it myself, the best thing one can do as a student and as an academic is try to be as truthful as you can. You know, we can't always be absolutely 100% truthful in, in life, but try it as hard as you can and seek the, the dialogue with someone who has a different uh, view and and argue it out, uh, have that conversation rather than, you know, sulking and uh, and feeling, oh my God, you know, I can't even I can't even say what I want to say. That I think is is to a little bit of timidity uh, to there. And sometimes, okay, if you get censored, some people get stronger that way. There's a whole theory of Russian literature that it was so strong because the censorship forced writers to write against it that readers would, between the lines, get very well what they were trying to say. Uh, but the censor couldn't catch them because uh, you know, it was a way of, of writing well and getting your message across anyway. Sir, in one of your most recent books, and I'm going to read the title, African-American Writing, a Literary Approach. Um, First, can you tell us a few things about this book? Yeah. Well, I, it, it, it was a collection of essays that what fascinated me was that the, the I mentioned already this Abbe Grégoire who started the whole field. I hadn't known this really before. Uh, so we have a, a French idealist in the early 19th century, I think 1806, so he started uh, collecting this. And then he inspired a whole group of African-American intellectuals, but also, uh, you know, intellectuals of all backgrounds who wanted to pursue that uh, a kind of, uh, of study. And they were always interested in what is the best from a literary point of view, uh, you know, what emerges. Is it really different? I mean, the whole time in our conversation, we have sort of pretended as if there is a really deep, absolute uh, difference between African-American writing and other writing. That's, of course, not the case. 
I mean, you go through all the phases. There's romantic writing, there's realist writing, there's naturalist writing, there's modernist writing. It goes through very much the movements that many other uh, Western literatures went through and in close connection uh, with others. And so that's why it, I call the literary approach because I, I want to rescue in the, in the text the literariness and why, the, why these texts deserve to be read rather than you know, just be ticked off as something. Yes, I've done a, 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 a black author. Now I can you know, go back, teach my normal stuff or whatever the, the, the issue is there. But why is it important to study a group of texts uh, from this perspective of an ethnic group? Why, why, uh, why is this a reason? Why would, you, why would someone do it like yeah. that? Well, I mean, uh, to take your, your question further, you could say there is a danger in that if you create a closed circle and say, I want to be only interested in you know, what people of one group or of one sex or of one nationality uh, does and everything else I'm not interested in, that you, you're setting yourself up for a program of narrowness and for a program of you know, focusing on one thing only. And that one thing may turn out to be intimately connected to all the things you don't want to uh, read. So I think I, I agree with you that there's a danger. But pedagogically, it also makes sense to put together a series of texts that have been avoided because, you know, we have to face too the long tradition of black writing dealt not only with ordinary censorship, but with simply having great difficulty as black subjects to get to a newspaper, to be heard, to reach uh, uh, an audience. So, you know, if you have a runaway slave who writes a novel, that's already a, a very, you know, an, an amazing feature and gets a publisher to, uh, to bring that out. So these are interesting stories of social history as well. The novel may not be a great novel, but it's still a good story to keep in mind uh, in for an unfolding of literary history. So if you're interested in censorship, they're actually a, a, a perfect set of, of, te uh, of texts to look at for the self-censorship. Can I say this? What will white readers think if I say that? Uh, for censorship, no, you said this. Uh, you know, you're out uh, of our holy community. I think it, it works really very well. It's a, it's a very teachable field because you you have so many insights just by reading these books. Yeah, it is for sure very, very interesting. So, sir, because you're such a uh, famous scholar, right? Uh, and, uh, and a prolific scholar too. Um, I have a very mm, cynical qu question. So I think there are millions of articles um, and thousands or, or tens of thousands of books written by scholars almost every year. Mm -hmm. um, isn't this a way of actually, uh, you know, creating their ideas then, then uh, afterwards are buried in the, I don't know, in, in, the, in a cemetery of databases or something like that? Well, that's another danger. Um, I think there again, I, I try to encourage, uh, you know, students not only to be truthful, but to to write when they feel that they have something to say and to say it as well as they can so that the chance of this remaining even if it isn't heard at the, at the moment, uh, but to reach an audience uh, maybe in seven years, uh, you know, for academics, time is not as important as for journalists, you know, you have to be heard now or else you're out of the, the business. But for academics, I think to, to say, try to say it well, and try to imagine not only the immediate context that you want to reach. Um, nothing ages as much in academic writing than contemporary references, you know, saying uh, like today, a terrible uh, school shooting again, you know, so you make a reference to that, but in, in two years, nobody will, today it's a very upsetting thing, but if putting this into academic writing uh, makes it, gives it already this feeling it belongs to an archive. It will become part of what you said, the database of all these things that are uh, put out. There is a stiff competition now. Um, you know, people do write a lot and there are many publishing venues, uh, but still there is something that some ideas get heard more than Definitely. other ideas. And, uh, and 
if you think that your ideas that get heard are not the good ideas, then you have to fight for the good ideas. That seems to me. You know, that, that's what, what this is about. Um, but maybe there is something wrong with this system, right? Creating so much content that mm -hmm. then is basically ignored by most of the people. Yeah. The society doesn't actually have a contact with so many ideas that are produced. Right. Well, I mean, this is a common complaint in Eastern Europe after the end of the Cold War. Because uh, as long as censorship existed, every word mattered. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, because living in that kind of a, of a universe, defying a small rule of, uh, you know, I mentioned Alison's Invisible Man, which was translated into Czech, but couldn't be published because he had a, a whole series of critiques of the Communist Party in it. So it was uh, unthinkable of, of doing that. But the very fact that somebody had translated and that it sat on the desk of a publisher created a buzz around that that really mattered almost more than if it had been published at the, at the time. So I think words really matter the more repressive a society is. And when you say, oh, just put it on Twitter, I, I wrote it out, or you know, I took a photograph of myself, and put, you know, nothing matters because so much is going on. And that's, uh, that's, I think, what living in an open society means. You know, there's, <laughs> there's much more stuff out there and much more useful, useless stuff as well. But I think that's, uh, that's it. I think uh, you know, the individual words uh, will find a harder, uh, will have a harder time finding uh, the right ear in open societies than in closed societies, ironically. You know, because even just hearing about what happened, you know, got people already all uh, worked up in the in, uh, in days of repression. But is this a way of um, authentically connecting with culture? Uh, you know, being a scholar, writing mm -hmm. about a novelist or right. more than one, and then you know, hunt. Uh, you're you're mm -hmm. in a way you're 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 in a race for points, for conferences, mm -hmm. for journals, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, I mean, the wonderful thing about professorial positions, I had a, a, a colleague who told me it's a good racket to be a professor. You know, you, you have a lifetime position. You actually don't have to fight. You don't have to, you know, once you have tenure, there is not very much that you must do. You begin to imbibe it because people around you do it and you want to remain part of that conversation. And, you know, you want to contribute to this ongoing conversation, but you're not actually compelled to. Um, so uh, to complain that one has to do so much, I think would be, uh, you know, would be misplaced because it's just, I think, one of the most privileged positions you, ca you can have. I mentioned Goethe before. Goethe had to serve a duke, you know, for most of his life to have a pension that, you know, gave him enough money to live in a rather modest house and you know, read and write every day. Professors have that, uh, that uh, position. They have to teach, and they can do research on, on anything that they want to do, anything they consider important. So I think they shouldn't whine, but they should do what they, what they think is important, do it as well as they can. And if they find a lot of people opposed to what they're doing, try to convince the others that what they're doing is really uh, valid. I find that a an interesting uh, struggle, not a, a, a terrifying situation. One last question. Okay. It's the same for all our uh, guests. Can you please make a book recommendation? Maybe an um, Afro-American novelist. Okay. Well, I already mentioned Alison and I mentioned Charles Johnson. I think I will uh, go with uh, Charles Johnson uh, again. Um, for my uh, taking uh, my liking, I think one uh, a novelist who's almost not known in Europe, whom I find very interesting, is Charles Chestnut. He wrote at the end of the 19th century, and he wrote wonderful short stories of two types, one that took folklore, and very much, you know, Dvorak heard a musical and then he did a new world, uh, you know, a, 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 a spiritual, and he did a new world symphony on the basis of the music he heard. And uh, Chestnut heard these tales that uh, blacks told about slavery, and he made magic tales out of them that were connected to, you know, witches' tales and uh, supernatural tales. 
uh, that was the one side of, uh, and the other side was taking um, the, the genre of the social novel as it was popular at the end of the 19th century and trying to do it as well as possible, but including in, the, in that social novel contemporary themes that nobody else had, had written about, the, the themes there of the end of Reconstruction, of the beginning of what's called Jim Crow, a rule and doing it all in good style. So I think he's a, a very good early example. Now I think there are many, many writers who, uh, uh, you know, who would be uh, interesting uh, 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 to you. Um, and I think, you know, I don't, I don't have to mention any more names uh, of the immediate contemporary scene. But I still think Oxherding Tale. I want to do one more uh, pitch. Uh, uh, Charles Johnson published it in 1983. It's told as a first person singular by a, uh, a young man who is a, a slave. He grows up on a plantation and he has a tutor who is a Hegelian who teaches him all about uh, Hegel. And then comes a foreign visitor with a big beard to the plantation. It's Karl Marx. And he, uh, Karl Marx says, you have all the wrong ideas. And he you know, tries to take out the Hegelianism in his teaching. So it's a real novel of education but with a lot of whimsy in it, you know, just to take Karl Marx in, in the flesh and put him into a chapter of a novel, I think took some, uh, some nerve. And it's, I, I can't tell you the, all the jokes in it, but it's also really funny to read. It's a, it's a book that you, that you like for the, for the humor in it. Thank you so much for this very intriguing and at the same time generous dialogue. Vă mulțumesc și dumneavoastră că ați fost alături de noi și de această dată. Vă invit desigur să urmăriți și celelalte producții Marca OVT Media Hub. Toate bune și pe curând!